The reading today is taken from John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. When he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. After he'd said this, uh, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Dynamis, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been here four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? They took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. A dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. What an experience. And what a thing to hear said by the sister of the dead man. Lord, 
if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What a feeling Jesus must have had. When he sees her and he hears those words and he sees those who mourn for Lazarus, he cries. And as they move to the tomb, he cries again. And in his very soul, he is broken. Not just for the death of his friend Lazarus, but for the, the grief and the pain and the suffering of those he sees around him. So why hadn't he come earlier? Why couldn't the man who'd healed the blind keep this man Lazarus alive? Well, he could have. But he chose not to. And we're going to look at that together. When he hears of the illness of Lazarus, Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. And because of that, his disciples think, well, he's not going to go because Lazarus is okay. He's going to recover. Everything will be fine. We can get on with uh, the work that we're doing here, and we don't need to go to Jerusalem. Because as we'll see later on, they were worried about what the Jews in Jerusalem would do to Jesus if he was just two miles from it, because he was very unpopular with the Jewish leaders at that point. Um, but they were, they were safe um, up north at the time. But when Jesus says it won't end in death, he means something very different from what the disciples expect. A famous preacher of previous generations, Spurgeon, said of this, the Lord speaks of things not as they seem to be, nor even as they are in the present moment, but as they shall be in the long run. And so Jesus makes a promise. He makes a promise, this will not end in death, but it doesn't mean what they think it means, because they are concentrating on the moment. They are concentrating on the way things seem to be. They are concentrating on the way they want things to be. They want things to be well, so they don't have to go to Jerusalem. They, was, they thought there was no need for them to do anything. They could stay and be at peace. But then the moment comes when Jesus breaks their illusion and says, we must go. How often do we read the promises of God and interpret them for our own time and our own situation and our own special circumstances, and perhaps worst of all, for our own thoughts and needs and desires? In the middle of this crisis, there are people saying, oh, it'll be all be over by Easter, everything will be fine, and and all the doctors and scientists are saying, no, it won't. Why are they saying that? Well, perhaps if it's politicians, they're saying it to try and get the people who follow them to, to still like them. But perhaps for most who would believe that, it's because we want to believe it. There are times when we read the promises of God and we believe what we want to believe of them. And we need to stop that for the promises of God are much greater than we can begin to imagine. Jesus says, uh, we need to go. And the disciples give him all sorts of reasons not to go, mainly that the Jews want to kill him, and uh, them as well. They're afraid. They're afraid to do what Jesus is calling them to do. And they're afraid, not only afraid to do it, but they don't think there's any need to do it because, well, if he's asleep, he'll wake up. What's the point? Why put ourselves in danger? Why put ourselves out? Why make a difference if it's all going to be okay anyway? And Jesus has to tell them that Lazarus is dead. And I need to go and sort it out. Oh, they, how they didn't want to do it. But then one speaks for all of them, as, as sometimes he did. Thomas called Didymus, Thomas the twin. 
sometimes called by others Doubting Thomas. I'll never call him that. For he says, let us also go that we may die with him. We'll come back to Thomas the week after Easter, but here is a man who loved Jesus and who depended on him so much that he thought that if he's going to die, I'm going to die too, because there's no point to life without him. That's devotion. Are we devoted to God in such a way that we believe his promises in the midst of all that seems to be going wrong, all that is going wrong, all the worries and fears of the future, hoping that he will do this and that to put things right, rather than simply trusting in that promise, this will not end in death. For many in this season of crisis, death will come through the virus or through other ways. But for those who have put their trust in Christ, as Thomas trusted Christ, there is that promise, this will not end in death. Yes, there will be death, but it will not end there. There is promise and a hope for eternal life that begins now and that goes on into eternity, that goes on into the future. Spoken by the one who went through death for us, who went willingly to the cross, paying the price for your sin, for your failure and for mine. He is the one who promises this will not end in death. And he promises it for more than Lazarus in other parts of the New Testament. And so they go. And as they go, Jesus knows exactly what he's going to do. But in the middle of that, not only was there a promise given, but there is pain being experienced by Jesus. We've had the promise, we come to the pain. What would we have done when we got there? What would we have done if we had the power to raise this man to life? Would we have smiled inside as we got near, as we thought to ourselves, wait till these disciples around me um, hear and see what I am going to say and do? Perhaps if it was a Hollywood film, there would be music building tension uh, until the glorious moment when Lazarus was raised to life. Perhaps there would be some smugness. But Jesus talks to Martha, and he sees her pain and her suffering. But when Mary comes and says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, his heart breaks for those people. His heart breaks for Mary and for those around, those in their loss and their pain and their suffering. Oh, he knew what he was going to do, but still he wept. And that is how it is for God as we suffer and as we go through pain. As we cry out to him and we think, Lord, will this not just end? And we think that God has deserted us, perhaps, but he has not. And he cries the tears that we cry. To Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20, he says, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. And so he does. Jesus is moved by the pain and suffering of a broken world. Oh, he sees the end. He sees the glory. He knows what they will feel in mere moments. But in the midst of their pain, he cries for them, and he cries for you, and he cries for me. Though he sees the end even more glorious than what was seen for Lazarus. So often when there is a temptation to flip-flop between despair and triumphalism, to think that we should not despair, which we should not if we trust in God, but to have this triumphalist attitude that, that tells the world and that tells ourselves that absolutely everything is going to be fine and all will be okay, and then it is not. And the enemy has a, a chink, a crack to poke into and to say, I see you trusted God and he let you down, but no, he didn't, for he keeps his promises, but he keeps the promises that he makes not the promises that we'd like him to make. 
And as we wait, He mourns with us. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This is the reality. There is pain and there is suffering now. Even as we trust in God and even as He walks with us and weeps with us. But you see, there isn't just the promise and there isn't just the pain. There is the purpose in all that Jesus is doing in these moments. And His purpose is the glory of God. He says it from the beginning. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son might be glorified through it. He says to Mary, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Oh, they talk about the resurrection. These are not unbelievers. These are people who know and believe that Lazarus will rise in the resurrection. They have that trust and they have that knowledge, and they're trusting God for the future. It's just in now, the pain is too much. He tells them to open the tomb, and they don't want to do it because there'll be an odor. He says, didn't I tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And so in their pain and in their suffering, They do what they can. They do what God tells them to do. And they trust Him in spite of all that seems and in spite of all the way it looks. And they open the tomb. There's no great big build-up. There's no great music. There's no roll of the drum. Jesus simply says, Lazarus, come out. Oh, once it was said by disciples, who is this man that even the winds and waves obey him? But I say to you today, who is this man that even the dead obey him? For what did he say at the beginning of all this? This will not end in death. Oh, there may be death was implied, and the disciples didn't see it but this will not end in death. And out comes this man, and it would almost be comical if if it wasn't so serious, stumbling around in his grave clothes. And because of what they'd seen and what they'd heard, the many who'd come from Jerusalem believed, and so the words of Jesus were proved true. Glory was brought to the Father and to the Son. And many knew who he truly was. And that is God's purpose. Oh yes, the glory of God. God wants to show his glory and to show his majesty and to show his power and to show his wonder that we might believe and find salvation in him. It talks in the scriptures about God holding back from bringing judgment day, that many more might come to believe in Him and find salvation in Him. Who knows why trouble comes? Some like to think they know better. Some like to think that as they guess and as they work it out with their logic, they can say, for instance, why the virus has come. Well, I say this advisedly, they are fools. For God alone knows. Oh, we can describe its um, spread and we can describe what happens, but who knows in the end why? But that is not the purpose that God wants us to have. That is not the the thinking that God wants us to have. God instead wants wants us to hear His promise, to know that He feels our pain, and to see that in everything, 
He longs to bring glory to himself and people to salvation. Today, as you sit at home, as you watch this, as you hear these words, ask yourself, what has God promised you? And have you accepted that promise of salvation, that promise of new life, that promise of of a relationship with him that comes when sins are forgiven and wrong things are put right? Do you understand that in your pain and in your worry and in your fear, God sits with you and weeps with you as he sees your heart break? And there is no satisfaction in knowing that there is glory to come, for in that moment, he cries with you. But also he says, will you let me show you your glory, my glory? Will you let me see? Will you come? Will you believe? Will you see the salvation that I want to bring? Will you see that this will not end in death? For death is not the end. Those who have gone before, who have trusted in Him and have found life in Him, see that glory as it is. The Apostle Paul tells us that we see now like through a mirror, darkly a bad mirror, through a glass, just darkly we see glimpses of the glory of God, but one day we will see it in all its glory. Lazarus died again. Oh, he was alive for a while, and his sisters rejoiced, and the people around rejoiced, and they believed God. But Lazarus died once more. He, but even that death for him was and is not the end. And the same can be true for you, and I pray that it is true for you. Here is promise. This will not end in death. Know that he knows your pain. And see the purpose. That in our circumstances, in what is happening to us day by day, he longs to show his glory. And he longs to bring to us all of us, his salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Father, may your glory be seen and your salvation known. Help us to know and to trust your promises and to know your presence with us in the midst of pain. Show your glory, O Lord, we pray. Amen.